Good evening, everybody. It's, it's great to be back. Welcome to the webinars. Tuesday, December 15th, 2015. So tonight's webinar really is an old one, one that we're redoing because I think it's especially pertinent at this time of year during the holidays, and it's one that's near and dear, dear to my heart. Having sent my son away to our wilderness program years ago during the holiday season, I'm especially sensitive to the difficulty and the challenge that it is for families to be away at this time of year. Although I've said many, many times that I think it's perhaps the most powerful of programs during special times like this because I think it reinforces the idea, the need, the, the, the pull for families to be, get, be together. And I think that that, that presents a, a kind of emotional leverage for us to do our work, both for the client or the student in our program, but also for the family. So with that backdrop, let's talk about ways that you can remain connected or develop a connection to your child while they are away from home, specifically and out of home placement. Let's talk a little bit about connection and what it is. The thing I always say is it's not about proximity. A lot of times people will talk about specifically with people that might have attachment issues or might even come from adopted families that they're afraid that making a placement out of home is going to re-traumatize the child. And what I have to illustrate for them or what I do illustrate for them in this idea is this idea that proximity, nearness, is not necessarily evidence or, or does not necessarily create attachment. It is a person's emotional and psychological presence in somebody else's life. And that can happen at a distance. Sometimes it begins to develop or at least flourish in our program through letter writing. And of course the foundation of connection is the development of the sense of self on either part, on either part of the person in the relationship. So we think about it in terms of bonding and attachment, right? We think about it in terms of how attached the child is and can be to the parent and how well bonded the parent is to the child. And so it's important for parents to realize, to make that shift from, it's about being in the same place at the same time, about being in the house. And a lot of you can attest to the fact that while your child was home, maybe even recently or during the holidays, you did not feel very close to them. I'm going to add an aside today because I was talking to a parent today about this. This idea that a parent said to me that they want to get back to the way things were before. Maybe a sweeter time, a time when they felt more connected to their child. And my response is, you'll never get back to that. that that's not even the ideal. But what you're going to get to if you do this work and your child does this work is a more evolved form of connection, right? You're going to become much richer in your psychological capacities and so will they. So the connection you have in the future will be much, much deeper and much more intimate. That is the promise of this work. And, and so when we long for that, that past kind of connection, we're longing for something that we can never nor would we ever want to necessarily go back to. We can't go back to. We've passed the point of, the no, of no return because we're developing. It's this idea of developing a balance between an identity, a sense of self, and the ability to remain connected. That really is what we call differentiation, right? It's our ability to be able to say, I see you, I hear you, I can connect to you, I can listen to you, I can contain you. But each of us are valued for our own individual identity, our feelings, our thoughts, our truth. And that is called being in a, in a relationship with somebody that is an adult. And most of the time in our lives, it's children to children that are forming relationships. I was just illustrating for a family today this idea that when a, a child can set a healthy boundary, an adult child can set a healthy boundary with the child, that they know that they are safe when the parent can respect it, even if the parent might be sad, right? Even if plans have to change. If the other person is taking care of them, you experience your sadness, but you respect it. That's called having an adult relationship. And in the case of a parent to a child, if your child is younger than a young adult, you become the adult in this situation alone many times, right? You develop a capacity to be strong, to show up, to be present, to be mature, to not be reactive. doesn't mean that you're devoid of feelings. It just means that you're able to respond from an intentional place instead of reactive place. You're not asking your child to take care of you. In therapy, I've thought about it for years, about connecting to the person and not the defenses. And that's very difficult because the things that people do to protect themselves hurt other people. I'll repeat that. The things that we do to protect ourselves often hurt other people. And so the defense is, is often prickly, right? It's often, often off-putting. And so it becomes our job as parents to be able to see through that, to be able to sort out and own and deal with our feelings, but develop the capacity to see through defenses. 
going to the other end of the extreme. We don't want our empathy and understanding to rob our boundaries, right? When our understanding asks us to sacrifice boundaries that make us feel safe and okay, then we're doing it wrong. We're going too far. It's okay. The, the, the adage, the, the, the maxim that I can take care of myself, right? Well, I, this is what I need to feel okay in this relationship, in this house, in this situation, is an okay and an appropriate maxim. Um, I, I think we, we go through a, a lot of different emotions, and the more adult, the more developed, the more evolved we are, we recognize that connection involves a whole range of emotions. Many people think of connection or intimacy in only positive terms, right? In terms of warmth and love and affection. Intimacy means two naked souls showing up. In the case of a, a parent and a child, it means that even when you're mad at me, even when you don't like me, even when you think I don't listen, that I don't love you, I'm able to see and nurture you in those moments. Now, if you're attacking, if I don't feel safe, I, I get to set boundaries. But, but I have the capacity to see you even when seeing you means that I have to confront some of my, my greatest fears about not being loved or being abandoned by my child. I, I used this old story from years ago. An old gentleman at a wedding breakfast stood up to give a toast and said to the bride and, and the groom, if you're, not, if, if, one of you, if you're not fighting with each other, then one of you is an idiot. And it's that idea that it's okay to have conflict and that we evolve and, and we grow through conflict and difficulty. And I think a lot of times we walk on eggshells with each other, right? We try to manage the other person and control the other person by de denying or, or not expressing our truth. That's not intimacy. That's, that's a, a placid state. But intimacy means I'm going to take the risk and tell my truth, even at the risk of being rejected. That my child is going to get to say, I don't like this. I don't want this. I don't think you love me. I felt hurt. I felt angry. I disagree with you, I don't feel hurt, and that we have the capacity to contain all of that, to sit with all of that. Like I said, this idea about attachment disorder, attachment disorder is a continuum, and there is a qualification of attachment disorders that is reactive attachment disorders. That's not what this webinar is going to be about, but I will say that all of us fall somewhere on this attachment continuum about how well attached we are. Our work the work that we do, and I'm going to talk about that a lot tonight, the work that we do, the foundation that we set by understanding our history, our roles, our rules, our family of origin, all of those things, the more work we do in the, that area, the greater the capacity we have to provide for our children a healthy attachment. The greater that work is, the deeper that work is, the more we can come from an intentional, right, a, a, a place from the frontal lobe, from the higher thinking, and respond without falling apart without disintegrating, without feeling threatened, without, re without the knee-jerk reaction. Oftentimes families will say about this process that they feel closer to their children during this process than they ever do. And part of that is because we're providing an opportunity for differentiation. You know, letters take days to go back and forth. Unfortunately, because of technology, you get your letters the day that they brought in from the field. In the old days, they came in through snail mail or, or through fax machines that somebody would have to go to a, a post office store to get, or maybe their office. And then what that provides for is an opportunity to sit and reflect. It provides for a context where when I'm writing to you, I'm, I'm more apt to look for my truth because I'm not measuring myself by how you react. I'm not trying to manage you during a communication. I am trying to ideally find and, and, and speak from my truth, my source. So connection, the foundation of connection, I say this all the time, the first necessary ingredient in connection is two whole or, or nearing whole selves. The more whole we can be, the greater the capacity we have for differentiation. And that is, to, to oversimplify it, the, the beginning and the end of, of what allows us to be connected to other people. How important is this? I can't think of, I can't talk too much about the importance of connection and attachment. To be able to be there for a child, for another person, creates validation, safety, and, and creates a, an internal copy for them. You know, your inability to, to sit with somebody when they're angry at you, when they're accusing you of something, that is because you're not carrying around to some extent an internal copy that you are okay. 
because that wasn't given to you. The same is true with our children. The more we have that inside, it doesn't matter what you say or do to me. I, I can protect myself from being hurt or attacked, but it doesn't matter in terms of the, the, the quality of what you say or do to me because I'm not questioning whether I'm okay, even when you're accusing me of not being okay. Because I know, because I found that experience in the relationship with another. The greatest mitigating factor to trauma that we know of is a healthy, stable, present adult in a child's life. Metacommunication. The, the metacommunication that comes from being heard and being connected to being seen is this experience that we are not alone, that, that I'm not crazy, that I'm not bad. And, and there are so many times when we inadvertently send that message to our children, right? When we send this shaming message. Well, even the phrase, I don't get you, I don't understand why. Why did you do that? All of those messages, the, the meta communication, the communication beneath the words is something's wrong with you. Something's mixed up in your head that you would think that. And so it becomes our responsibility as parents to understand our children, even when it seems insane, right? Doesn't mean we have to sacrifice boundaries. Hear that again and again and again tonight. But it does mean that we can approach it from a place of love and compassion instead of a place of judgment and fear and anxiety. Esteem, the greatest contribution you can make to esteem is providing a healthy attachment for your child. And again, where does that capacity for a healthy attachment come from? It comes from a rigorous, consistent exploration of your own life, of your own history. We know that from research. A child learns through healthy attachment to take risks, healthy risks, because there is a safe place that they carry with them, right? And attachment studies we know that the child is able to move farther and farther away from the safe parent because they know that they have a safe home base to go back to. And even when the parent isn't present, they can do that in the world, out in life. It teaches empathy, right? When we provide healthy connection, it teaches empathy because empathy is taught this way. It's not taught through guilting. It's not taught through, look what you did to somebody else. It is taught by our modeling. It is taught because when I can empathize with you, even when I think that you're being crazy, when I can empathize with you, then you can find your feelings. And when you find feelings, if you being in that person of a child, when you find your feelings, when you learn how to feel, when you're safe to feel, when you don't feel crazy for feeling what you feel, when you feel all those things, you have the capacity to see and sense feelings in others. That's where empathy comes from. I learn how to feel, I can see it and sense it in others. And again, it develops a strong sense of self. That's why a lot of the time we'll talk about and treat and respond to symptoms, but really what we're trying to do is help develop a stronger sense of self, right? And, and that was going to come with mistakes and setbacks and regression and detours. What are the roadblocks to connection? Our anxiety and our fear. Our anger and our frustration, right? At least they are evidence of disconnection, right? If I get angry at you, if I'm frustrated with you, I can't possibly completely connect it to you, can I? Because I, if I fully, just imagine, hypothetically, if I fully understood where you were coming from, I would understand and have compassion. I still might not want you to do it. I still might want to encourage you in another direction that might bring you more peace and joy and love and connection in life, but I wouldn't be frustrated and I wouldn't be angry. I wouldn't be disappointed. And because my anxiety and fear leads to me wanting to control you, those are also roadblocks to communication. Again, all of these feelings are normal. Please don't hear me say on this webinar, don't feel what you're feeling. However, own it. That's the solution. That's the middle ground. It's not don't feel it or do feel it and let it run, right, uh, unbridled. It is feel it, own it. It's valid. It's real. Anybody in your situation would feel it and then make it your project. Our own sense of low self-worth or doubt prevents us from being, from being there for the child. The reason that we need our child to like us is because we don't want to be bad. The reason that we need our child to forgive us, the reason we need our child to think we're great, you know, and I could go down the list of attributes. The reason we need all of that from our child is because we're missing something in here, right? We're not carrying around that, that internal copy. Our self-doubt if we had, just imagine hypothetically, if you had perfect self-confidence and somebody called you an idiot, what would you hear? You would simply hear that they are hurt and you would actually be inclined to say, I'm so sorry, I must have done something to hurt you, please tell me about it. But when we are riddled with self-doubt and somebody tells us we're an idiot, we defend ourselves, we argue, 
we ignore, we dismiss, we do all of those things. And, and, and evidence of this is kind of a chicken and the egg experience, we have to learn and know that it's okay to take care of ourselves. In fact, if our boundaries were respected as children growing up, we would know that self-care is important, right? We wouldn't, be, we wouldn't believe it's selfish. We wouldn't get out of balance in that way. We would know that in order to, to be able to provide for others, we need to have a full belly. And that's not selfish or self-centered. It's healthy. It's human, right? A lack, lack of experience or, or tools in this area. Right? We, don't, we don't have a context that we come from where connection was profound or significant. We don't have a, an example or a set of tools to practice. Sometimes what I say to people is, let's practice what it would look like. Let, let's demonstrate what it would look like or illustrate what it would look like. And why can't you get there? What's getting in the way? And then we're, we're off, right? We're on the track of helping discover what are the roadblocks to connection. Our aversion to discomfort and emotional pain, of course, is going to be a roadblock to connection. We, we, this, is a, this is a courageous, forgive me for saying this, heroic task to provide, to develop the capacity for healthy connection. We want to control, sometimes that looks as benign as teaching or focusing on the outcome, right? We want things to go well, we want successes. We start to not value the struggles and the setbacks, only valuing the success. And thus we, we become an unsafe character in the plot of our children's lives. The need to be a good parent, the need to be a good therapist, the need to be a good husband. I was just talking to a family today, giving an assignment over the holidays and say, you're going to get, have a bunch of family gatherings. Don't try to change any of your behaviors. Just observe it. Pay attention to boundaries. Pay attention to when family members overstep their boundaries. Pay attention to how you feel. Pay attention when you overcompensate or you try to control other people or there's conflict. Pay attention to it. The reason I say don't change it, don't improve it in the next few weeks because if you try to improve it, if you try to do it good, you're going to have a conflict because you're going to be prone to not see it because I don't want to see anything that, that's bad or uncomfortable in myself or I'm just going to change it. And there's value in observing it. So try to get out of this idea that we need to be a good parent. I mean, that, that, that's some, something that got passed down. What, what will lead us to being the best parent we can be is accepting our humanness, right? That's what all the great enlightened souls on this planet that have ever lived have taught us. Is that the road to enlightenment, to awareness, to kindness, to love, to transcendence, is when we are able to look at the parts of us that are broken. That we're not so threatened by the idea that we have faults and flaws and limitations that we run from them or hide from them or justify them or block them out. Parental guilt goes right along with that, right? There's, there's very little utilitarian value for, for parental guilt. It, it handcuffs us. It, it limits us. It paralyzes us to set a healthy boundary, to take care of ourselves, to say, I need this. To I have so many parents that don't even think about, and even when I coach them to do this struggle, to say, I need this to feel okay. They say, why am I even in the equation, Brad? Well, why is it about me? And my response is, you're always in the equation, whether you acknowledge it or not. But your job is to take care of yourself first and to do what you need to do to feel okay and to love and connect to your child. And the boundaries will flow naturally out of that healthy self-care. Right? I need this room clean. I don't feel comfortable with it. Some friends are coming over. This is what I need. I'm not comfortable with you smoking marijuana. I can't live with you cutting. I'm not going to be okay with that. So we, we start to understand that, that as we fight against the legacy of guilt and shame, we develop a healthier sense of self, a greater capacity for connection, and a capacity to lead our children in a healthier way. Our, our attempt to focus on, we're about to have the new Star Wars movie out. Darth Vader is the greatest example of somebody who thought that the solution was to control other people, right? The fear, the anxiety, the hurt that he felt led to him wanting to, the character, led to him wanting to control others. So don't be Darth Vader, right? Learn to let go. Learn to set boundaries. People that don't practice control are more assertive, more honest, practice better self-care, stronger, more influential in many cases, and often help to facilitate change in others. What you can do, listen, the skill of listening, reflecting, and empathizing. If you haven't yet, folks, go to my blog, 
on eight tools for transforming relationships. Watch the webinar on eight tools for transforming relationships. It really does encompass a lot of these things. Learn to listen, learn to reflect, learn to empathize. Um, practice delaying uh, delay of reward as a parent. One of the greatest challenges for us is that we want to find the quiet port in the storm, right? That, that's really what gets us all stuck. So it's important for us to learn that in order to accomplish some long-term things, we're going to have to sacrifice, at times, some short-term rewards. And that's my biggest barrier for me. Learn the I feel statement. Learn, learn it, practice it, be rigid about it for some time. I, I could lecture on the I feel statement for six hours because it is, it is so rich in, in, in theory and a lot of, of mental health approaches. But because I don't have six hours tonight, practice the I feel statement. Get outside of your own paradigm. Some people accomplish that by traveling. Some people accomplish that by reading. A lot of people accomplish it by going into an Al-Anon meeting or a CODA meeting or going into therapy. Some of you are accomplishing it by exposing yourself to this kind of education, right? And that, it doesn't all resonate with all of you immediately. I have a lot of parents, especially early on in the process, that I have no idea what you're talking about. Feels kind of good. Some of it I get, but I don't know what you're talking about. Give it time. Get outside of your paradigm. Right? Challenge yourself. Stretch yourself. Take risks. I've had parents. We just had another very successful intensive this last weekend for young adults and, 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 and parents, actually. Come to the intensives. Go to the parent workshops. Go to all the things that we invite. We're not just asking you to do that because we think that you are fundamentally flawed. We, we do think you're human. We're doing that because we want you to participate in a parallel process. What better way to feel connected to your child than to be taking the same kind of risks they are? And how uncomfortable and hard is that? And, and yes, they have more symptoms than you all. And you send them to our program, young and old and adolescent alike. You send them to our program, and, and the expectation is that they open up, bear their souls to a bunch of strangers. Even at the risk, at times, of being assessed and having recommendations that they're not in favor of, on top of all the shame and fear on top of the, the fear of judgment that we all have. So take some risks. And when you struggle, share with your child that struggle. Empathize with them and feel connected to them. In the moment that you walk into an Al-Anon meeting or a CODA meeting or a therapy session or an intensive for sure or the parent groups or the, the parent workshop, in the minute that you do those, you'll immediately feel a connection to your child because you'll feel a lot of what they've been feeling. Like I said, do your own therapy, own your own stuff, Learn to practice getting your needs met. Learn to trust to a higher power. Or I like to think of it also as radical acceptance, this idea that it's, it, what is happening is not a detour. Right? It, it is the curriculum of your life, of this universe, from your higher power, however you want to frame it. While your child is with us, let us do the heavy lifting. You don't have to teach and lecture. There will be specific assignments that we will ask of you in, in letters, perhaps on phone calls or during a visit. However... Let us do the heavy lifting. Let us do the challenging. And sometimes that challenge is going to be after a foundation of empathy and understanding and listening. It's not going to be coming in, punching them in the proverbial metaphorical nose. Stop relating to your child's successes and failures to your successes and failures. They're not the same thing. Your child's successes are theirs. Yours are yours. Theirs are theirs. Yours are yours. You have successes and failures in parenting. But it's not how your child does. That is a loss of connection. Like I have always said, over-identification with the child is the most severe form of disconnection because in that equation, there's only one person parent present. <laughs> the parent and the mirror in the person of the child. I look at my child and I see myself. I look at their successes, their failures, and I see evidence of me. That's not seeing a child. That's seeing yourself <clears throat> and a reflection of the child. Um, Michael, I just want to check. My screen is frozen. Am I showing up? Are you hearing me? The video is frozen. Can you hear me, though? Okay, I'm going to go out, man. Bummer, I was really enjoying this webinar. All right, video is unfrozen. Don't know how long it was frozen, but... At least you're hearing it. <clears throat> um, I was just doing this and I looked over at that. I was saying if you just see your child 
excuse me, if you just see yourself when you look at your child, you're really not seeing your child is the simplest way to put it. Learning to understand them. Not understanding your children, no matter how crazy they are, is evidence of disconnection. And not understanding them often is a subtle, unconscious way of shaming them. It's to say, you are so crazy, your thinking is so crazy, I don't understand you. Practice forgiving yourself. Forgiving yourself for your humanness. You've forgiven your previous generations, many of you have. Forgetting yourself for your, your humanness allows you to be connected, allows you to be present with your child. And then practicing letting go. Letting go of the outcome. That means that you take action, you're assertive, you tell the truth, you make decisions, and you don't control the outcome. You make the best decision that you know how to make based on all that you know how to make, in any way that you know how to make it. And then you, you let the outcome go. This is the wrong slide. This is an image that I like. It shows a kind of a differentiation, kind of a balance, right? There is a wall and a boundary, but you're developing the capacity to listen. I want you to memorize, kind of instill this image in your brain. I have a couple of quotes to, before we close for the, for the last slide. One of my favorite quotes, two of my favorite quotes, this one and the next one. This is in my book and also in Chrissy Positek's Parallel Process by Henry T. Close. There's no question but that our parents failed us as parents. All parents fail their, our, their children, and ours were no exception. No parent is ever adequate enough for, being the job, for the job of being a parent, and there is no way not to fail at it. No parent is ever, ever has enough love or wisdom or maturity or patience. No parent ever succeeds completely. As kids, we needed more mothering than our mothers could give us, more fathering than our fathers had to offer, more brothering and sistering than we got from our siblings. Part of our task in growing up thus becomes finding our own sources of parenting. To add to what our parent, to what our mothers and fathers were not able to give us, we cannot wait for our parents' permission to grow up. We need to decide on our own to find other people to parent us, to find other people to give us what our parents couldn't. To grow up isn't easy, but in order to do that, to do that, we must forgive our parents. We must forgive them for our sake. We must forgive them for our sake, not theirs. When we do not forgive them, we are still expecting all of our parenting from them. We are clinging to them in the hope that if we wait long enough or do enough of the right things, or make them feel guilty enough, they will finally come through with enough parenting for us. But this is impossible. And in order for us to be really free to find other sources of parenting, we must forgive. So this, of course, is written to the child in all of us. But one thing you can do as a parent is to forgive yourself, and to let go, and to let your child recognize that you are, are, are a human being. He uses the, 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 the exaggerated la language of failure and so if that makes some of you feel uncomfortable replace it with the word human you're imperfect but he uses it that provocative language to make the point like stop being attached to it right being less than perfect in this particular task well what's it's not enough period it's not enough and then the quote on children from, from Gil Gibran and a woman held a babe against her bosom and said speak to us of children and he said your children are not your children. They are, sons, they are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not their thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might, that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness, for even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves also the bow that is stable. That's a poetic version of what it means to be disconnected, right? Do your work, get grounded, develop the skills, get on a parallel process, practice vulnerability, develop the sense of self that you can start to respond to your children through letters which, is, which are much easier than in person in this healthy, grounded, more complete way. Start to develop the capacity to see and understand your child even when it scares you. Fight the, the, the urge to shame others, especially your children. Understand connection and what it means. It, it's not about warm and fuzzy. It's not about sitting in the same room. It's about developing enough of a, of a capacity of self to be able to see others and also developing a capacity to tell the truth and to show up. Understanding and seeing and listening 
is part of it. Take care of yourself so as to be able to provide a connection. That is fundamental and crucial. It's evidence of the ingredient of wholeness and self and also leads to greater wholeness of self. Understand your own context and family of origin lesson, dynamics, roles, and rules. Look back on Learn about it more. Everything that's happened to you is either contributing to or getting in the way of your capacity to connect or provide that for your child. So learn from it. Look at it. It doesn't mean that you're the cause of the problem. It means you're the cause of your problems. It means you make contributions to others in your life. But have the courage to get past all the shame and guilt about being good or being perfect to look at this, to, to, to get on the heroic journey. Right? The hero's journey, the heroic journey, is really the journey of looking at oneself, of going inside of this, going into the metaphorical dark forest, forest to look at the unknown diving into the, the, the deep, dark waters or going into the cave. And, and practice learning. Learn about your child. Learn about their disorder. Learn about what they're learning. But not so much so that you're overworking or doing it to compensate or prove to them something. All of that is grounded in a lack of differentiation, in enmeshment, <clears throat> in codependency, and all of that. Do it because it's, it, it's its own reward. But if you're doing it with an expectation, like I said, it's evidence of codependency and enmeshment. All right, Michael, I'm happy to take questions or comments on topic. Go to, I'll do some announcement slides, and then I'll get back to, to topics. Can you expand on practicing delay of reward as a parent? I, there's two thoughts for that, that idea. Number one is understanding that you're not going to get, you, you know, if something is life-threatening, you're going to by any means necessary immediately. If your child's running out on the street, don't worry about your parenting skills. Just keep them safe. But sometimes... You're going to take time and let your child stumble and fall. For a lot of you, you did that, and then you ended up here, right? You've, you've practiced this. So it's okay to slow down and to realize that, especially when your child is safe in a program like ours or an aftercare program, I'm going to slow down and realize that sometimes the reward, the, 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 the payoff is going to come after some failures or some struggles. So you start to value the struggle. You also <clears throat> practice your own delay of gratification. It's okay to slow down. And then I have a third way. There's really three things that come to mind with this, this bullet point. And that is, don't be so quick to reward your child. Slow down. Take time. Right? The idea with most of this is that virtue is its own reward. Right? So put a reward off and see how internalized it is for them. All of these things require a greater sense of self. To delay our own gratification is one. To value the struggle in the greater context of developing a sense of self, and then to slow down and not try to manage our child by over-rewarding them too much. All apply to that, that, that idea, that concept. Right? Actually, there are three different angles on the same, same phrase. No other on-topic questions? All right. I have some new announcements tonight. A couple new ones. Look at this. Several parent workshops scheduled next year. We want all parents to go to at least one. Our January Heroic Parenting um, Intensive is full. Um, and then the next one is Finding You in February. And then we have some Heroic Parenting one in March, and then I have some in April and May that we'll, we'll come up with some titles for later. Contact at intensives at evoketherapy.com for more on our intensives or gail at evoketherapy.com for more information or to register for our workshop. People who go to both of these absolutely love it. The, the Entrada Parent Intensive is psychoeducation, group process, some experiential. The, the, the intensives on the right side of your screen are very deep personal work. The only qualification is that you have to come believing that you have some work to do. You can do pursuits trips for young adults, for your young adults, refreshers, sober fun, but also for families. So you can go to our website to sign up for those. We want every family to go through six of these meetings while their children are with us. Please don't wait till the end or to halfway. Please start going. Like I said earlier, great way to be connected to your child because <clears throat> they're experiencing many of the same feelings you will feel when you walk into these, including, I don't fit in here. I don't belong. These people are different than me. Uh, follow us on social media, twitter.com and Instagram at Evoke Therapy. We have moved off of the Second Nature page, so make sure you follow us on, on, on these pages if you want to Keep up to date on our blog, our Facebook, which has inspirational quotes, links to our blog, announcements, also our Twitter and Instagram at Evoke Therapy. 
uh, my book, we're, we're transitioning into soft copy, and, and excuse me, to, to, uh, yeah, to, to a soft copy away from the hard copy. So um, that's not what it's called, paperback. We're trans, uh, transferring to a paperback, so you can get hard copies, the last few hard copies in barnesandnoble.com before it goes to a paperback. You can also get Audible or CD Purchase. There's the Parent Alumni Foundation book page if you want to get books on any topic. All right, happy to look at any topic questions, Michael, that have come in. The workshops are in Southern Utah. You fly into St. George, Utah, or in to, it's about two hours from Las Vegas. You can, can, you can um, schedule that in line with a parent visit out to the field if your child is at Entrada, or you'd need a day to get to Cascade. So that's where the workshops are. Can we access the slides? I missed the first few. Absolutely. Always, if you go to the parent portal, if you're not on the parent portal because you've already you're a subscriber and you've already transitioned out of the program, you can just email us at, at our webinar at drbradreedy.com. If you are a parent, you go to any of the webinars, you click on the PDF there, and you can you can download slides of any of our over 200 webinars. Sorry for the screen freeze, and I don't know how long it was frozen. How do you do any of this if the child will not communicate with you? That's a great question. You know, it takes two to connect, right? But you can provide the fertile ground for it. You can provide the opportunity for it. And see, connection can be one way. I can connect to you. I have children that hate me, yell at me. My children get mad at me. If I can see them, if I'm doing my work, I am still connected to them. They're not necessarily connecting to me at that point, point but I'm connected to them. A client who wants to tear my head off, for example, if I see they, if I see their pain, if I see their fear, if I see their anxiety, if I see their powerlessness in all of that, I have connected to them. So, and that is our job as adults, right? Is to connect to them. Their ability and willingness to connect to them is now up to them. So you can still connect to the other, see the other, understand the other, and so forth. How do I access the point portal? Call your parent coordinator if you don't know how. If you are a current parent, you should have had a, a tutorial on it. You, you go to the website and you log in. If you don't have that login number, you talk to your parent coordinator. So there's a when you click on the little brown menu button at the top left of our home screen, there's a login button at the bottom. If you're on a laptop or a small computer, you might need to drag up the screen. But press login, then you log in with your login and your password, and then you're on the parent portal. And then you can click on the menu and go to other things like the webinars. And if you don't have a password, talk to your parent coordinator. And if you're out of the program, then you don't have access to the parent portal. I went to a few Allen on Me's and I find a lot of similarities with what Evoke has introduced. Absolutely. There's truth in Allen on Coda. There's truth in so many things. When people say they don't believe in AA or Allen on or certain theories, I'm like, you're, you're, you're looking at the differences. There's truth that overlaps in all of these theories and approaches. And Allen on is a fantastic overlap to a lot of what we talk about and teach. Most importantly that you do your own work regardless of whether the addict or the other person is doing self-sabotaging behaviors or unhealthy behaviors. All right folks, I'll be back Thursday night, Thursday this 17th this week. I'm going to be talking about codependency and co-participation, co which is a wonderful follow-up to this webinar. Um, I'll be combining two or three of our, 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 the sessions, the webinar sessions we've done on codependency. So look forward to doing that. 7 o'clock, Mountain Standard Time, day after tomorrow. Take care, folks. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.